Hello everyone and welcome to Phoenix Gaming. We are doing something a little bit different today. We're going to move more into the realm of theory crafting. Um, I'm going to share with you uh, sort of, I guess, a philosophy that I have in approaching games. For those who know me really well, one of my strengths as a gamer is that I tend to pick up new games really quickly. Um, I will sort of figure out sort of uh, what is important and what kind of core values are. Um, so I tend to I tend to actually be sharpest and sharkiest uh, when everyone has played a game like fewer than ten times, and as everyone starts to get good, those those gaps tend to close. And I think one of the reasons for that is what I'll just dub today is the the grand evaluation theory. Um, my dad made a comment on it some years ago that there's a lot of games where I tend to just kind of collect stuff, and then after collecting stuff, I I do something with it. Um, and that is that is a very true description of, of a sort of like basic play style that I'll execute in a lot of games. And I think it has a lot to do with this, you know, so-called grand evaluation theory. Um, I'm going to posit what this is. I'm then going to talk about it in the context of Lost Ruins of Arnak today to give an example. I'm going to do a second video um, about wingspan using grand evaluation theory. And then if this is a kind of video that people like, find is interesting or valuable, I'm I'm gonna I'm happy to apply this to more things. So let me know um, in the comments if that's a thing that you're interested in. And if there's a particular game that you want me to deconstruct sort of with this idea. Um, so without any further ado, let us talk about what I mean when I say grand evaluation theory. So this is sort of my approach towards evaluating how good stuff is in games. You know, when you pick up a new game, particularly a new Euro game, uh, you are just looking at piles of stuff on the board. There's tons of options, all those Euroglyphics that are out there, which I think is a phrase that I stole from Space Biff, which I love. Um, and you're trying to figure out, like, what you want to do. And there's, you know, maybe a core gameplay loop that you do or don't understand at the point in time. But there's a crap ton of rewards, and you don't know how to make heads or tails of what the rewards necessarily are. Uh, maybe you get access to a wild resource and you could take a thing of your choice, but how are you supposed to know what to take if there's not anything in particular pointing you in a direction, which is often the case in a game. You start to learn the game, you say, oh, okay, this is better than that, but you can get there pretty quickly by sort of studying, I think, what is laid out in the game. Most game designers, by their nature, want to create stuff that is balanced, fair, or at least fair feeling, and they use math models, either like official, really fancy computerized math models or just kind of stuff that sits down in a spreadsheet somewhere or in a notebook somewhere. And things oftentimes scale well to each other. And our general assumption in this, um, in modern board gaming, when we're using grand evaluation theory, is that folks are building something that is supposed to be relatively commensurate and players are trying to get edges on each other over the course of the game if they're doing the core thing of what they're supposed to be doing. So here is the question being asked in grand evaluation theory. What is the quote unquote base resource and how does everything, every resource, every reward in this game relate to one another? What do I mean by that? The most easy example is games that have money. Usually games with money, coins, anything like that coins tends to be the base resource and then those coins can convert into other things oh those three coins can convert into a wood these five coins can convert into a stone and if i paid 10 coins it's going to be a victory point point. and the game might not explicitly tell you something like that but you can sort of tell that that is how the game or the game designer has approached thinking about this game either based on how those resources are being converted or on based on how those resources are being acquired. So like I said, this is primarily useful in Euro style games. It does work with other stuff as well, and it doesn't work with every Euro style game, but I do find um, asking myself this question early when I'm learning a game to be pretty insightful. If the game has a lot of different resources in it or a lot of different rewards in it, this is going to be useful. If the game really has only you know kind of one axis of rewards, it's not as useful. So applying grand evaluation theory to something like, um, let's say, Azul is a little bit silly because you're not managing a whole lot. You're just kind of, it's, it's you know, and that's not even really a Euro game. It's more of an abstract game. 
Um, but you generally want games to be at a certain level of complexity. They don't need to be complex um, for this to be valuable. If there's just a few things in the game, then spending your time thinking about base resources may be not very helpful. Um, this is not a rule. It just helps give you an insight into what is good, what is powerful, what feels above grade, what feels below grade. Um, it, of course, doesn't consider context at all. What is good for you in a given moment, like raw power, does not be what you need right now. Um, and that is actually where most game designs create their points of tension. It's by asking you, what do you need in this moment? Or how do you work your way towards this thing? Arnak is a really, 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 really good example. This is why we're choosing it for our first one today. And then the last thing is that, you know, using grand evaluation theory, it can actually open possible avenues of potential exploitation in the game. So the rest of this video is probably going to make more sense if you've played Lost Ruins of Arnak, you have a sense of the rules. Uh, but if not, I'm still going to try to make it make some sense. So I'm going to start off with just a very, very brief overview of what it is that you do in Arnak on any given turn. You're collecting resources. You have two workers and five cards that you're going to draw. And in order to put a worker into play, generally you need to spend one of those cards. So of those five cards, two often will go towards your workers, three will do other things. And so um, you can do other actions, but that's that's sort of the, the core loop that we're going to start off with here. And so we're actually going to start off by talking about the cards in your base deck. So you get two of each of the cards that I've just thrown up here in the base deck, the exploration card, the funding card, and the fear card. Fear card doesn't give us anything. A funding card, if you, you know, even if you've never played the game, you can tell it gives you a coin, it gives you a lightning bolt, an immediate one coin if you play it, and exploration gives you a compass. Um, assuming that these cards are equal, which we don't know that they are, but I'll, I'll shortcut to tell you that they, the game treats them as equal, um, both of them give you one thing. Also, fear card lets you use a boot, funding card lets you use a um, car, and the exploration card here lets you use a boat. Um, so those are in lieu of what the card is actually doing. So the fear card is either worthless or uses a boot. The funding card is either a coin or uses a car. The exploration card is either a compass or uses a boat. Um, right off the bat, I can see here that using this fear card is net value upwards, right? Like that's a thing that is nice. If I can use this fear card for something, that is a positive effect on me. To um, sort of shortcut things just a little bit, essentially the game designers uh, value having a car or having a boat at one, just like a coin is one and an exploration token is one. All of these things are worth roughly one. one thing, one unit, right? Um, they are compared to each other uh, in that way. So let's take a look actually at the game board. Get out of your cards. And talk about where I get my primary answers from. So the first thing I would look at is the action spaces. Now this board might look very messy if you haven't played Arnak, but if you just focus below these core five spaces, um, let's make that a more bright color. These core five spaces down here, or I guess really you could argue one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten spaces, although in this case it's only five because I'm playing two players. So, but these spots at the bottom are worker placement actions, right? You have workers that can go out. In order to send a worker here, you need a boot. So if you haven't played the game, essentially like in order for my worker, oops, in order for my worker to go here, I would need to use a card that has a boot on it or better, you can drive somewhere or sail somewhere if you could walk there. So to go back to my cards here, I can either go there by playing a fear card or by playing a funding card or by playing an exploration card. Now it's obvious that I would choose to play a fear card in this instance because those other two do something. So a fear card, by playing this fear card, using this card that is worth nothing in my hand, in it going to play, it's gonna get me two compasses. Now, suppose you didn't have any fear cards in your hand and you might be asking yourself the question like, well, do I wanna use this exploration as a compass or do I wanna use this boat symbol to go and get two compasses out there? Well, that's a really, really easy answer. Two compasses are worth more than one compass, right? So um, we can make that decision as long as we have any of these two workers or archeologists, I think they're called available to us, but we would prefer to use the fear if that is the card that we have available in our hand. Now. 
let's consider what the game designers have said is important to them in this game or what these resources look like to them in this game. So we see that there's two compasses that you can get as a reward. And there's no inherent reason why I would think this space is meant to be better than the other spaces. So they think that two compasses, two dollars, and two books, tablets, whatever they're called, are roughly of the same caliber. And you can use this rule of thumb for the rest of the game. Anytime you see a compass or a dollar or a tablet, you know that for the game designer, that's worth roughly one thing, and these things are roughly tradable with each other. Now that gets more complicated because when we look over here, we see going here gives you only one arrowhead. This implies that one arrowhead is worth two tablets, is worth two um, coins, is worth two compasses. So in that sense, an arrowhead is worth two. Over here, this says um, discard a card to get a gem. So there's an additional expense here. You have to pay a card. And what we've seen from cards is they're either worthless, the fear card, or worthwhile, you know, the, um, the compass or expiration card. If I can discard a fear card, amazing. Um, but presumably this is some cost. And as you interrogate this more throughout the course of the game, you see that discarding a card is evaluated by the game designers as one. So they think, okay, you're discarding one thing. So this essentially, this unit of having discarded a card increases the value of these rubies and since the discard costs one the ruby is worth three don't believe me let's take a look at this track over here on the right so this track over here on the right is called the research track and generally advancing up this research track costs an equal amount of raw power no matter where you are relative to the um the row that you're on so this very first advancement where you can choose between going this way or going this way, you could spend a compass and an arrowhead, which I've argued are worth one and two for a total of three, or you could spend a gem, which I've argued is worth three to move up. Same thing with this next row, gem worth three, tablet, arrowhead, also three. Now, we have an expensive jump here because we've got one, two, three, four. So that's a pricey area. And then we've got a whole bunch of choices. Well, two arrowheads are two each, so that costs us four. Then we've got the gem and a book, so that's three and one, which is four. Then we've got the arrowhead, the book, and the coin, so that's four. And if you run this all the way up this table, you're going to see that no matter what row you're in, every choice you make is equivalent in terms of raw power. Now, the game challenges you to say, hey, what specific resource do you need at specifically what time? And also branching paths, and there's a couple little reward bonuses along the way. But, but functionally, the game just says, what do you have available to you? I don't really care as long as it's in this specific exchange of resources. Um, but power-wise, they're all roughly equivalent. And hey, if you look at the value that I'm kind of putting these, um, you know, these base actions at down here, uh, they're roughly equivalent as well. Now, this next part isn't going to make as much sense if you don't play Arnak, uh, but bear with me because you might be able to follow along. In order for me to go to these center region areas, I need to use a boat rather than a, you know, a fear card, rather than a boot card. So I would have to have discarded, you know, one of these cards, these my, my base cards, um, you know, that gives me one resource. So I'm paying one resource. I'm discarding one valuable card rather than a crappy fear card in order to go to this location. I'm not going to worry about the fact that you spend resources to open these locations because you get a reward for those resources and the monster and stuff like that. Ignore that for now. Pretend that this spot is just available for you to go to. And I want you to notice that the game says, hey, you pay one to go here, but I now give you one, two, three rewards which is essentially the same as going down here, right? I've paid one resource to gain three resources, and this persists on every single card in the middle with two weird exceptions. Um, here, we haven't seen this yet, but a curse, negative card, the game treats as minus one. And so we have here three for the gem, one for the compass, that's four, minus one for the curse, which means this is valued at three. And if you went every single one of the um, level one 
locations, you'll find that they're going to be worth three. The exception is the weird get a free item site that is either better or worse depending on your circumstances. And the other thing that you will notice is that the game treats drawing a card as worth one as well, which I'll come back to a little bit later. All the way at the top here, if you want to travel to these locations, it's going to cost you two cards or two icons. There's a way to make it so that it's not two cards, but we'll pretend for now that it's two cards out of your base deck. And the reward up here is actually higher. Up here, you get one, two, three, four, five. And if you go through all of these, and I actually think it is the case with all these that it is, they are all worth exactly five. Um, they are all worth five. So the game says now, okay, well, you've paid two. I'll give you five. That's a profit of three, which is actually more than the profit of two that you were getting in the mid-level or the bottom level. And so what that tells me is in a vacuum where your cards don't matter, the icons are not important to you and you're able to get access to them by going to the top action spots, you have just generated additional value. You paid two to make five. It still costs you just the one worker. If you have access to these cards, you have just created additional points for yourself. Um, by playing this game a whole bunch of times, you might be like, oh, I noticed that people who go to the top row tend to win a lot. Uh, and, oh, you know, unlocking the top row, blah, 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 blah. But just through this, just through like looking at how powerful the rewards on those actions are and comparing them to what the game is asking you to pay in for them, you can say, if possible, I really should be going to these top spaces if they're available to me. And I think most people that play this game, they you know, pick up on that sense intuitively, but I think there's a, a strong mathematical basis here um, to look at that and, and understand that that's what's going on here. Okay, so in Arnak, that's my argument for essentially what base resources are. We're gonna talk about assistance in a little bit to even completely hammer my point home. Um, but I also want you to notice that kind of along the way here, there's rewards for getting up there. The rewards are almost always one. One, 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 one. And if you are the first person to get to a spot, these rewards are also worth one. You might wonder what this one, if you haven't played the game, is that I um, just bumped into there. That's an upgrade. So it lets you turn a book into a uh, arrowhead, a one into a two or an arrowhead into a gem, a two into a three. That's all it does, which again, just validates our theory of how are things being evaluated by the game designers. You don't need to look very far to look for some validation that the game designers are putting the draw a card at the same level as getting a one. Um, and like we said, when we looked at these cards, you know, if the card's not a fear card, if the card's not a fear card, it's worth one, right? Just drawing a card off our deck, if it's an exploration or funding, is worth one thing. Um, either, you know, a travel icon or, you know, a gold or a compass, right? Um, obviously, the fear is worth zero, so that's a little sus and maybe makes the draw cards worth a little bit less. But this game also allows you to add cards to your deck. Uh, and in fact, if you're adding good items to your deck, then suddenly card draw can go way up in value. Um, in fact, the game that I played of this most recently, I played a card drawing strategy where my deck was full of very, very good things. And this is one of those exploitations that I was talking about. The game values the reward of a card draw at one, but I get more than one out of that reward because I've made my deck more powerful. So every time I draw a card, I'm probably drawing more than one in value from doing that by having a lot of good items in my deck. Um, this game also cares about context specifically. Uh, a really good example, particularly on this side of the board, the, the bird side of the board, is that coins are not used that often. Um, you need compasses, for those of you who haven't played the game, to actually unlock these level one and level two these level one and these level two locations. So that's a part of kind of why compasses are important and why they're used. Um, coins just buy you items and items improve your deck. But as you might assume in any kind of Euro style game, buying items early is good and buying them later is really not as good. And so coins have a pretty serious drop off in terms of their value. Um, so the game you know, values coins at the same level as these other things. Uh, but that being said, I think that most players intuitively understand after a little while, but um, there's no way to tell from the grand valuation theory side of things that coins are not really as good as the other things, but the game treats them that way. So you need to think about that when you are considering your rewards 
Um, generally what that means, and that comes from experience rather than the grand evaluation theory, is that you know this guy is just a smidge, smidge, smidge better than this guy. But the game doesn't care. The game treats them as equal. Um, that's the opposite of the card draw, which I was just arguing is like maybe a little bit better. Um, this is not true on all different maps of this game. And you know, again, context really matters, but I generally think the tablet is one of the best single rewards you can get. If you look at this track, you'll see that there are tablets kind of all over the place that you need to, to move up the track. And the other thing you'll notice a lot on this track is tons and tons of arrowheads. So on this side of the map, arrowheads are a little bit more strong even though they're the same value and they're evaluated the same way, but because they are more prevalent up the track, they're a little bit more powerful, right? There's a required block of these books and um, arrowheads right here in the middle. Every player needs to get these resources, which creates a little bit of a crunch on that resource. Um, but again, that is context. That's not the evaluation component of it. Um, of it. Um, let's take a look at the assistants. So the assistants, for those of you who haven't played, are you know people that you'll get by advancing uh, your, you have two things that advance up this research track here. And by advancing your second thing up the research track, you can get these assistants, which give you a uh, one bonus every given round. So this person right here gives you a compass every round, plus one. This person right here gives you an upgrade every round, plus one. This person right here gives you a discount of $1 on a purchase, plus one. Now, this person right here is probably more the most powerful of the three um, because compasses can be used for a lot of things and are quite versatile. This person, upgrading stuff is nice, but it requires you to have low graded things like lots of tablets, lots of arrowheads to make use of. And this person does require you to buy something, which means that you are kind of locking in your actions a little bit. Um, let's look at a few of the other um, do, 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 do these four, I think are some really good examples, oops, are really good examples of harder to evaluate assistant. I don't know, I have to cut that out. Um, I froze for a second there. So we're going to evaluate Miss Earring here. And, uh, she basically says, Hey, spend a coin to get an arrowhead that spend one to get two. So surprise, surprise, she is a plus one every turn. The problem is she is then demanding for money which may or may not be a problem. And she gives you arrowheads, which may or may not be very worthwhile. So if you were listening to what I said earlier, I said, I think coins are worth a little bit less and arrowheads are worth a little bit more on this side of the map. I think this lady's quite good because I think coins are easy to get because I think they're evaluated the same as everything else, but we don't really like them as much. And well, my computer does not like what's going on. Um, <laughs> but the arrowheads are needed, so maybe worth a little bit more than two. So I think she generates additional value when you're playing on this side of the board with this particular map. Cool. Um, this guy, I said that the game evaluates drawing at one, and it does with the exception of this person, which to me says there was a playtest thing that came along where they had him drawing cards and he was just way, way, way too powerful because usually drawing a card is better. So this person actually says draw a card and discard a card, which according to the game's math, means that this person actually generates no value each turn. So how much how much power this guy generates in your deck completely depends on what your deck looks like. He is the best in a deck that has a bunch of good cards and a bunch of bad cards, because you can draw your good cards and discard your bad cards. Um, but he is one of the weakest because at, on raw value, he is worth plus one, minus one, zero. The Exiler here is one of the cards, you know, the game values Exiling at one. Um, exiling gets rid of a card in your deck. It's particularly valuable for getting rid of those fear cards, which are worth minus one point at the end of the game. By the way, a lot of things that have in this game have um, a value of one do convert into one point at the end of the game as well. So fear card's a great example of this. So she removes a card from your deck and um, that that is worth one, which is totally fine. The thing is that if you cannot remove fear cards, you're not really getting the full value out of this lady. Now you can get more fear cards over the course of the game. You know, we just saw an action space um, that is it that has that. So she might be worthwhile in a game like that, but usually she's worth a little bit less than generating one per round. And then you might look at um, our friend, the, uh, the, go to sleep. 
the prospector over here who is widely considered to be the most powerful of the assistants and it should be very obvious he gives you two rather than one um, but he does give you coins which we said is maybe a little bit uh, weaker than other things but no question you should be grabbing the prospector just the raw power alone you'll figure out what to do with the coins along the way um, if you're crafty and uh, make good use of him so that's the basic idea of what we're looking at when we're considering grand evaluation theory what can we look at how do these resources compare to these other resources and then as i'm moving up the tracks you know do i think this is easier to deal with harder to deal with like let's look at these monsters here these monsters that you have to kill this one costs four to kill right it costs you two and one and a discard a discard is maybe great, it's maybe bad. So if you're deciding, ooh, do I wanna go fight that monster, which often you don't get to choose what monsters you fight, but even still, um, if you have a fear card in your hand, that discard is awesome, it's basically free. I'm so happy that I drew this guy. Also, the reward of drawing a card is maybe better than average. Um, this guy, on the other hand over here, also costs four, but he costs a weird four because he costs two and one, and then they valued a boot at one, apparently. Um, you'll look through all the monsters. You'll notice that every single monster is four um, in one way or another. And uh, so you, you might say with this guy, well, that that seems okay. But if you don't have a fear card in hand, then generating this boot requires you to have two coins or to use a car or a, um, a boat in order to do that. So this one can be a real pain to deal with. And also I made the argument that I thought tablets and arrowheads were good on this map. So in context, I think this is actually one of the toughest monsters to fight. Meanwhile, up here, we've got a little frog guy who's been cut off at the top because of the, the picture that I took. Um, and he just asks for two. And I said that I think I evaluated cars at one and I do, but you'll notice that sometimes cars are evaluated at one and sometimes cars are evaluated at two in the game, which is a little bit funky, but to me says, hey, killing this monster is easier than killing most of the other monsters. Um, so that should be a target or one that I'm pretty happy to go and get along the way. Um, again, you don't necessarily have control over those things, but by looking at this math, hopefully it can guide you a little bit. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. I'm gonna do another one in just a moment from now, um, basically discussing grand evaluation theory in the context of wingspan. Uh, so you can see me sort of consider this idea of how are we evaluating numbers in relation to each other so that we understand which of our actions are powerful, which of our actions are weak. Thanks for watching everyone, appreciate it. Have a great day.